Valvular Heart Disease, Chapter 36. The heart contains two valves, the mitral and the tricuspid, and two semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonic, which control blood flow through the heart. Normal position of the valve leaflets or cusps when the valve is open and closed. Valvular heart disease is defined according to the valve or valves affected and the type of dysfunction, so stenosis or regurgitation. The pressure on either side of the open valve is normally equal. However, in a stenotic valve, the valve opening is smaller. The forward flow of blood is impaired. This creates a difference in pressure on the two sides of the open valve. The amount of stenosis or restriction, or excuse me, constriction or narrowing is seen in the pressure differences. The higher the difference, the greater the stenosis. When regurgita regurgitation occurs, this is often referred to as incompetence or insufficiency, closure of the valve is incomplete. This results in a backward flow of blood. So this is a figure of valvular stenosis and regurgitation. The open position of the stenosed valve on the left and position of the closed regurgitant valve on the right. Most cases of adult mitral valve stenosis result from rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic mitral stenosis is widespread in underdeveloped countries. Less common causes are congenital mitral stenosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus. Rheumatic endocarditis causes scarring of the valve leaflets Contractures and adhesions develop between the commissures or the junctional areas. These deformities block the blood flow and create a pressure difference between the left atrium and the left ventricle. As a result, left arterial pressure and volume increase, causing higher pulmonary vasculature pressure. The overloaded left atrium places the patient at risk for development of atrial fibrilla fibrillation. Hemodyn this is the hemodynamic effect of, my of mitral stenosis. The stenosed valve is unable to open sufficiently during um, systole inhibiting vent left ventricle filling. Here's another figure of um, mitral valve stenosis and vegetation. The st uh, stenotic mitral valve takes on a fish mouth shape because of the thickening and the shorting, shortening of the mitral valve structures. The primary symptom of mitral stenosis is exertional dis difficulty breathing um, due to reduced lung comp compliance. Heart sounds include a loud first heart sound and a low-pitched diastolic murmur. This is best heard at the apex with the stethoscope. Fatigue and palpitations from arterial fibrillation may also occur. Emboli can arise from blood stasis and the left atrium secondary to atrial fibrillation. Less often, patients may have hoarseness, hemoptysis, and chest pain. Emboli can form in the left atrium, secondary to AFib, causing a stroke. Mitral valve function depends on intact mitral leaflets, mitral annulus, chordae tenendae, papillary muscles, left atrium, and left ventricle. A defect in any of these structures can result in regurgitation. Damage to valve caused by an MI 
chronic rheumatic heart disease, mitral valve prolapse, ischemic papillary muscle dysfunction, and infective endocarditis. MI with left ventricular failure increases the risk for rupture of the chordae tenendae and acute MR. Mitral valve uh, regurgitation allows blood flow blood to flow backward from the left ventricle to the left atrium due to incomplete valve closure during systole. Both the left ventricle and the left atrium must work harder to preserve an adequate cardiac output. In acute MR, the sudden increase in pressure and volume transmit, transmits to the pulmonary bed. This results in pulmonary edema and, if not treated, cardiogenic shock. In chronic MR, the additional volume results in left atrial enlargement left ventricular dilation and hypertrophy, and finally a decrease in cardiac output. <clears throat> this is a figure of mitral valve regurgitation. The clinical course of MR is determined by the nature of its onset. Patients with acute MR will have thready peripheral pulses in cool clammy extremities. A low cardiac output may mask a new systolic murmur. Rapid assessment, so a heart cath, and intervention like valve repair or replacement are critical. Patients with chronic MR may remain asymptomatic for many years. Early symptoms of left ventricular failure may include weakness, fatigue, palpations, and difficulty breathing. This gradually progresses to orthopenia, proximal nocturnal dyspnea, and peripheral edema. Increased left ventricular volume leads to an audible third heart sound, so S3, even with left ventricular function. The murmur is loud, holosystolic, murmur at the apex and it radiates to the left, ex left axilla. Patients with asymptomatic MR must be monitored carefully. Surgery for valve repair or replacement should be considered before significant left ventricular failure or pulmonary hypertension develops. Mitral valve prolapse is abnormally of the mitral valve leaflets and papillary muscles that allow the leaflets to prolapse or buckle back into the left atrium during systole. It is the most common form of valvular heart disease in the United States. The use of the term prolapse can be misleading because it is used even when the valve is working normally. It's usually benign, but serious complications can occur including um, MR, um, infective endocarditis, SCD, and heart failure. Oh, and also cerebral ischema. Although the etiology of MVP is unknown, there is an increased familial incidence in some patients. This figure shows the mitral valve prolapsing or buckling when it's closed. Looks like a hood. M-mode and 2D echocardiography are used to confirm AVP. MVP, excuse me. MVP covers a broad range of severity. Most patients are asymptomatic and remain so for their entire lives. About 10% of those MVP become symptomatic. A characteristic is a murmur from regurgitation that is loud during systole. Um, MVP does not alter S1 or S2 heart sounds. Severe 
mitral regurgitation is uncommon but serious complication of MVP. Dysrhythmia is most commonly ventricular premature contraction, so PVCs. Proximal supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia may cause palpitations, lightheadedness, and dizziness. Infecti infective endocarditis may occur in patients with mitral regurgitation associated with MVP. Patients may or may not have chest pain. The cause of the chest pain is not known. It may be the result of abnormal tension on the papillary muscles. If chest pain occurs, episodes tend to occur in clusters, especially during periods of emotional stress. Difficulty breathing, palp palp palpitations, and syncope may occasionally accompany the chest pain and do not respond to anti-anginal treatment. So the nitrates aren't going to work. Beta blockers may be given to control palp palpitations and chest pain. Encourage the patient to stay hydrated, exercise regularly, and avoid caffeine. Patients with MVP generally have a benign manageable course unless problems related to mitral regurgitation develop. No accepted medical therapy appears to delay the need for valve surgery in this group. A teaching plan for patients with MVP is presented on Table 36-11. When teaching the patient and or caregiver, caregiver how to manage mitral valve prolapse, you should um, number one, teach the patient the importance of antibiotic prophylaxis for endocarditis before undergoing certain procedures if the patient has MVP with a regurgitation. Uh, number two, instruct the patient to take the drugs, take all drugs as prescribed. For example, make sure that they know they have to take those beta blockers to control their palpitations and their chest pain. Number three, advise the patient to adopt healthy eating habit, habits. Avoid caffeine because it is a stimulant and may exasperate symptoms. Four, you gotta counsel your patient who uses diet pills or other over-the-counter drugs to check for common ingredients that are stimulants. So they need to look for anything that has ephedrine or caffeine in it. Those two will exasperate symptoms. Encourage the patient to begin or maintain an exercise program to achieve optimal health. Instruct the patient to contact their health care provider or emergency medical services if symptoms develop or worsen. So if they start to um, feel the palpitations, um, fatigue, shortness of breath, or anxiety. Congenital aortic stenosis is generally found in childhood, adolescence, or young adulthood. In older adults, aortic stenosis is a result of RF or degeneration. Aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis due to rheumatic heart disease accompanies mitral valve disease. The incident of rheumatic aortic valve disease has been decreasing, but degenerative stenosis is increasing as the population ages. Aortic valve stenosis causes obstruction of blood flow from the left ventricle to the aorta during systole. The effect is left ventricular hypertrophy and increased myocardial oxygen consumption because of the increased myocardial mass. As the disease progresses, uh, compens compensatory mechanisms fail. Reduced cardiac output leads to decreased tissue perfusion, pulmonary hypertension, and heart failure. Left untreated, severe aortic valve stenosis has approximate, approximately a 50% mortality rate at one year. Manifestations 
of aortic valve stenosis develop when the valve orifice becomes a, about one-third its normal size. These manifestations include the classic triad of angina, syncope, and exertional difficulty breathing, reflecting left ventricular failure. Auscultation of aortic valve stenosis often reveals a normal or soft S1, a diminished or absent S2, a systolic murmur, and a prominent S4. The prognosis is poor for patients who exhibit manifestations and whose valve obstruction is not fixed. Nitroglycerin is used cautiously to treat angina as it can significantly reduce BP and worsen chest pain. So the nurse is caring for a patient with aortic stenosis. For what should the nurse assess the patient? For A, systolic murmur, B, pericardial friction rub, C, diminished or absent S4, or D, low-pitched diastolic murmur? The answer is A. Clinical manifestations of aortic stenosis include angina, syncope, difficulty breathing on exertion, heart failure, normal or soft S1, diminished or absent S2, systolic murmur, and prominent S4. So you have acute AR or chronic AR. So AR may be a result of, of primary disease of the aortic valve leaflets, the aortic root or both, trauma, Infective endocarditis or aortic dis dissection can cause acute AR and constitutes life-threatening emergency. Chronic AR is generally the result of rheumatic heart disease, a congenital bicuspid aortic valve, syphilis, or a chronic rheumatic condition, such as alkalosing spondylitis or reactive arthritis. AR causes retrograde, or that just means backward, blood flow from the ascending aorta into the left ventricle during diastole. The results, this results in volume overload. The left ventricle initially compensates for chronic AR by dilation and hypertrophy. Myocardial contractility eventually declines and blood volume in the left atrium and pulmonary beds increase. This leads to pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure. Patients with acute AR have sudden signs of cardiovascular collapse. The patient develops severe difficulty breathing, chest pain, hypertension, indicating left ventricular failure and cardiogenic shock. It really is a life-threatening emergency. The patient with chronic AR generally remains asymptomatic for years, so only difficult having difficulty breathing on exertion, orthopenia, nocturnal difficulty breathing, and those only develop after considerable heart dysfunction has occurred. Angina occurs less frequently than in aortic stenosis. Patients with chronic severe AR develop a water hammer pulse. What that means is, is that it's strong, quick beat, and then it collapses immediately. Hard sounds may include a soft or absent S1, presence of S3 or S4, and a soft high-pitched diastolic murmur. Diseases of the tricuspid and the pulmonic valves are uncommon with stenosis occurring more frequently than regurgitation. Tricuspid stenosis occurs almost exclusively in patients with RF or who use IV drugs. Tricuspid stenosis results in right atrial enlargement and elevated systemic venous pressures. Clinical manifestations include peripheral edema, ascites, 
heptomegaly, diastolic low pitch murmur, and increased intensity during inspiration. Pulmonary stenosis is almost always congenital and results in right ventricular hypertension and hypertrophy. Clinical manifestations include fatigue and a loud murmur. Diagnosis of valvular heart disease includes information from the patient's history and physical examination and a variety of tests. A CT scan of the chest with contrast is the gold standard for evaluating aortic disorders. An echocardiogram reveals valve structure, function, and heart chamber size. Transesophageal echocardiography and Doppler color flow imaging help diagnose and monitor valvular heart disease progression. Chest x-rays reveal the heart size, altered pulmonary circulation, and valve cal calcification. <clears throat> An ECG identifies heart rate rhythm and any ischema or ventricular hypertrophy. Heart cath det detects pressure changes in the heart chambers, records pressure differences across the valves, and measures the size of the valve openings. An important aspect of conservative management of valvular heart disease is prevention of recurrent RF and IE. Treatment depends on the valve involved and the disease severity. It focuses on preventing exasperations of heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, thromboembolism, and recurrent endocarditis. Heart failure is treated with vasodilators, positive inotropes, uh, beta blockers, diuretics, and low sodium diet. Anticoagulant therapy prevents and treats systemic or pulmonary emboli. It is used prophylactically in patients with AFib. Atrial dysrhythmias are common and treated with calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, antidysrhythmic drugs, or electro electrical cardio version. <clears throat> An alternate, alternative treatment for some patients with valvular heart disease is PTV, PTBV, percutaneous transluminal balloon valvuloplasty. During this procedure, the fused commissures are split open. The balloon valvuloplasty valvuloplasty is used for mitral tricuspid and pulmonic stenosis and less often for aortic stenosis. The procedure is done in the heart, heart cath lab. It involves threading a balloon tipped catheter from the femoral artery or vein to the stenotic vein, excuse me, to the stenotic valve. The balloon is inflated in an attempt to separate the valve leaflets. A single or double, a double balloon technique may be used in the procedure. Currently, the use of a single balloon with hourglass shape allows sequential inflation. This technique is most popular because it's easy and has good results with few complications. Um, the procedure is generally indicated for older adults and for those who are poor sa uh, surgery candidates. The long-term results are similar to surgical results. The decision for surgical intervention depends on the patient's clinical state using the New York Heart Association classification system for a functional disability. The type of surgery can be valve repair or valve replacement. The procedure that is used depends on um, number one, the valves involved, number two, path pathology and severity of the disease, and number three, the patient's clinical condition. Valve repair is usually the surgical procedure of choice. It has a lower operative mortality rate and the valve re than valve replacement and is often used in mitral or tricuspid valvular disease. Although valve repair avoids the risk of replacement, it may not restore total valve function.
So valve repair is a procedure of choice for patients with pure mitral stenosis. The less precise closed method has generally been replaced by the open method. So in a closed procedure, the surgeon inserts a dilator through the apex of the left ventricle into the opening of the mitral valve. The direct vision procedure or open procedure requires the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. The surgeon removes thrombi from the atrium and makes uh, an incision. Next, the fused uh, cordae are separated by splitting the papillary muscle and debriding the calcified valve. In a valvoplasty, it, this involves repair of the valve by suturing the torn leaflets. Cordae tenendae, or papillary muscles, it is primarily, primarily used to treat mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. It's minimally invasive valvoplasty. Surgery involves um, a robotic or thoroscopic surgical system. Results compare with those of an open procedure. In addition, um, shorter lengths of stay, fewer blood transfusions, less pain, and lower risk of sternal infection and postoperative AFib have been reported. <clears throat> For patients with mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, further valve repair or reconstruction using anleoplasty is an option. This involves reconstruction of the annulus with or without the aid of prosthetic rings. Prosthetic valves are categor categorized as mechanical or biologic. Mechanical valves are manufactured from artificial materials and consist of combinations of metal alloys, um, pyrolytic carbon, and dark, uh, dacron. Biological valves are constructed from bovine, porcine, and human cadaver heart tissue and usually contain some man-made materials. A decellularizing process removes the cadaver cells from the valve. This lowers the risk of immune response and tissue rejection. Biologic valves are asymmetric in shape and produce more natural pattern of blood flow compared to mechanical valves. Asymmetric mechanical valve prototypes are being tested. Mechanical val uh, prosthetic valves are more durable and last longer than biologic valves. However, they have an increased risk of uh, thromboembolism and require long-term anticoagulation therapy. The main risk of mechanical valves is bleeding from the use of anticoagulants. Biologic valves do not require anticoagulation therapy because of their low um, risk of bleeding, however, they are less durable and tend to cause early calcification, tissue degeneration, and stif stiffening of the leaflets. The choice of valve depends on many factors. For example, if the patient cannot take an anticoagulant, um, a biological valve is considered. A mechanical valve may be best for a younger patient because it's more durable. For patients over 65, durab durability is less important then the risks of bleeding from anticoagulants. So most receive a biologic valve. Figure A is a star Edwards caged ball valve. Figure B is St. Jude by leaflet valve. Figure C is Carpentier slash Edwards porcine. And figure D, core valve transcatheter aortic valve. A wide variety of prosthetic valves are available for use. Desirable valves are non-thrombogenic and durable and create minimal stenosis. Prolonged waiting time for aortic valve replacement is associated with greater mortality and should be done on a semi-urgent basis. 
obtain the following health information related to the health history and functional health patterns from the patient. Past medical history should include um, rheumatic fever, infective endocarditis, congenital defects, heart attack, chest trauma, cardiomyopathy, syphilis, Marfan syndrome, streptococcal infections. We want to find out if, if they've had any of those things. Functional health patterns, so for their health perception and health management, have they used any IV drugs or are they fatigued? Activity and exercise, we are going to assess to see if they have palpitations, generalized weakness, activity intolerance, dizziness, fainting, um, difficulty breathing on exertion, cough, hemoptysis, orthopenia their sleep and rest patterns. We want to find out if they're having difficulty breathing in the middle of the night. Um, and then their cognitive and their perceptual. Um, are they experiencing any angina or atypical chest pain? We're going to perform a focused physical assessment for the following clinical manifestations. Um, we're going to assess for a fever. When we're looking at their skin, do we are they experiencing diaphoresis, flushing, cyanosis, clubbing, or peripheral edema? Their respiratory, are they experiencing crackles, wheezes, or hoarseness? Cardiovascular, uh, any abnormal heart sounds, including murmurs, S3 and S4. Dysrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation, PVCs, tachycardia, um, elevations or um, either changes either going up or down in pulse pressure. So is there hypertension typically? Is it higher than it used to be or is it lower? So any change in pulse pressure. Um, hypotension in particular, water hammer or thready peripheral pulses. That's a key assessment finding for these folks. Uh, gastro, we're going to assess for enlarged liver, ascites, unexplained weight gain, Nursing diagnosis for patients with valvular disease may include but are not limited to um, decreased cardiac output, excess fluid volume, activity intolerance, and deficit knowledge. The overall goals for a patient with valve disease include normal cardiac function, improved activity tolerance, and an understanding of the disease process and health maintenance measures. Diagnosing and treating streptococcal infections and providing prophylactic antibiotics for patients with history of RF are critical to prevent acquired rheumatic valve disease. The patient at risk for endocarditis and any patient with certain heart conditions must also receive prophylactic antibiotics. The patient must adhere to ordered therapies. The person with history of RF, endocarditis, and congenital heart disease should know the symptoms of alveolar heart disease so early medical treatment may begin. A patient with progressive alveolar heart disease may need outpatient care or hospitalization for management of heart failure, endocarditis, embolic disease, or dysrhythmias. Heart failure is the most common reason for ongoing medical care. Your role is to implement therapeutic interventions and evaluate their effects. Design activities considering the patient's limitations. An appropriate exercise plan can increase cardiac tolerance, but activities that cause fatigue and difficulty breathing should be limited. Strenuous physical exercise should be avoided because damaged valves may not handle the increased cardiac output demand. Develop your patient's care plan to emphasize conserving energy, setting priorities, and taking planned rest periods. Consider a referral to a vocational counselor if the patient has a physically or emotionally demanding job. 
Tobacco use should be discouraged. Perform ongoing cardiac assessments to monitor the effectiveness of the drugs. The patient on anticoagulant therapy, for example, warfarin or Coumadin is another name, after surgery for valve replacement must have the INR checked regularly to determine proper dosage and adequacy of therapy. INR values of 2.5 to 3.5 are therapeutic for patients with mechanical valves. Teach the actions and side effects of drugs to achieve compliance. The patient must understand the importance of prophylactic antibiotic therapy to prevent IE. If the valve disease was caused by RF, ongoing prophylaxis to prevent recurrence is necessary. Teach the patient when to seek medical care any manifestations of infection, heart failure, signs of bleeding, and any planned invasive or dental procedures require the patient to notify the health care provider. When valvular heart disease can no longer be managed medically, surgery is necessary. The patient must know that valve surgery is not a cure and that regular follow-up with the health care provider is needed. And then finally, we want to encourage the patient to obtain and wear a medical alert device. The expected outcomes are that patient with valvular heart disease will maintain adequate tissue and organ perfusion, achieve fluid and electrolyte balance, achieve optimal level of activity, describe disease process and appropriate measures to prevent complications. A 19-year-old patient with rheumatic heart disease is admitted to the hospital with recurrence of rheumatic fever. In planning care for the patient, which nursing diagnosis should the nurse include? A. Ineffective, ineffective coping related to refusal to carry out health promotion activities. B. Risk for infection related to recent exposure to group A. Um, beta hemolytic streptococci. Uh, C. Impaired adjustment related to unsuccessful lifestyle modifications, goal setting, and problem solving. Or D. Ineffective health management related to lack of knowledge about long-term prophylactic antibiotic therapy. The answer is D. A patient with a history of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease will need long-term or lifelong continuous prophylactic antibiotics to prevent recurrence of the disease.